Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to our ongoing discussion of anesthesiology. In this lecture, we're going to talk about some of the effects that anesthetics have on basic body functions. We're going to emphasize the effect on the respiratory system and the cardiovascular system, and then briefly cover effects on the hemostatic system and the acid-base balance. So, does general anesthesia have an impact upon respiratory function? Anesthetic vapors reduce the breathing center's response to changes in arterial carbon dioxide, or partial pressure carbon dioxide in the blood. Vapors increase the rate of breathing, but decrease tidal volume, and the overall effect is to reduce minute ventilation. This has the effect of allowing carbon dioxide to rise in the blood. In extreme cases, very extreme cases, oxygen level may also drop, resulting in hypoxemia or low blood oxygen and reduction in the general oxygen delivery to tissues. Opiates and opioids also have a major effect upon the respiratory system. They also reduce the brain's response to rising carbon dioxide in the blood. But the increase in tidal volume, but they increase the tidal volume dramatically and decrease respiratory rate, thus reducing minute ventilation. So they work exactly the opposite of how vapors work. The overall effect, however, is still to allow carbon dioxide to rise, which under normal circumstances would have a major stimulating effect upon the respiratory center. However, the presence of vapors or opiates interferes with that response from the respiratory center. So carbon dioxide continues to rise and does not stimulate more breathing. So how do we take care of these changes? We can assist the patient's breathing by simply applying more ventilation through a bag and mask or through uh, intubating the patient and using a ventilator. And we can increase the minute ventilation very easily through that process. We can allow the patient to breathe spontaneously with a reduced minute ventilation and allow the CO2 to rise somewhat. This is generally not a problem, at least in relatively healthy people and for short, relatively short periods of time. We try to avoid this in older people or people who have uh, cardiovascular problems which may be unstable because a rising uh, CO2 in that uh, situation uh, may cause instability. Under very unusual circumstances, the anesthesiologist may give a respiratory uh, stimulant. But I can say that in the nearly 40 years I've been in practice, I've never done this. And in fact, I fear it because when you do use respiratory stimulants, there's a high probability of increasing cardiac oxygen demand, and also it can lead to seizures and un other unexplained and unexpected uh, events. You must carefully monitor the patient's expired carbon dioxide levels and adjust ventilation to maintain a tolerated level of carbon dioxide. And this is basically what we all do. So this slide is to try to indicate to you the different effects that drugs have upon uh, the uh, oxygen or, or carbon dioxide stimulation of breathing at the, at the respiratory center. The first line shows what happens if there's slight increase in arterial CO2 in a normal person who's awake. You can see that even a very minor change in PCO2 results in a marked increase in minute ventilation as we try to blow off the CO2 and improve breathing levels. With opiates, we tend to push this curve to the right. So there continues to be a response to increasing CO2 but the response is late and slow. When we add in inhalation an, uh, agents, we further depress the response, not only shifting it further to the right, but decreasing the slope as well, so that there is a delay in response to rising CO2 and an inadequate response to a rising CO2. So should we ventilate or should we let the patient breathe spontaneously? The advantages of uh, mechanical ventilation is it's very easy to control the minute ventilation with mechanical ventilation. You just adjust the tidal volume or adjust the rate. Very easy to do. But then on the other hand, spontaneous ventilation requires no instrumentation of the patient's airway. You don't have to intubate them. Spontaneous ventilation allows the patient to set their own ventilatory pattern, which is often perfectly okay, but 
in the presence of many drugs or other disease processes that may be going on, it's not always the best, uh, the best model to follow. In either case, constant monitoring of breathing and expired carbon dioxide plus the patient's oxygen saturation is necessary with all general anesthesia so that mechanical versus spontaneous uh, ventilation is usually determined by the expected length of the surgery, the patient's position during the surgery, and the need or lack of need for muscle relaxation during the surgery. Some of the cons of uh, managing ventilation with a ventilator are it's very easy to overventilate the patient. And this can cause a decrease in carbon dioxide in the blood, which causes a condition known as respiratory alkalosis. This again is generally not terribly important, but it's not something you want to allow to exist for any extended period of time. In addition, if you're going to mechanically ventilate a patient, you must in instrument their airway. And there are always risks that you won't be able to do the instrumentation, won't be able to get the endotracheal tube in, or that in your struggle to get it in, you may damage the airway and cause the patient not only difficulties during the surgery, but difficulties subsequent to surgery. Spontaneous ventilation, on the other hand, is often associated with a rise in the carbon dioxide and the development of respiratory acidosis. This is well tolerated at moderate levels and is well tolerated for short periods of time, particularly in healthy and younger patients, but may be a critical mistake in elderly patients with unstable cardiac uh, disease. So how about the cardiovascular system? Does general anesthesia have an impact upon cardiac function? How about the anesthetic vapors? Some anesthetic vapors can reduce the contractility of the heart and reduce cardiac output. These tended to be the older vapors such as halothene, but modern vapors such as isoflurane, desflurane, and sevoflurane have little or no effect upon cardiac contractility. They do unfortunately, or fortunately depending on the situation, have an impact upon peripheral resistance, which is the resistance of which, against which the heart has to work when it, when it contracts. And low peripheral resistance may result in low blood pressure, but it may also allow the heart to contract more fully. So there's a balance all the time trying to maintain it just right. If you reduce blood flow too much, you can reduce it to the brain, the kidney, and the heart itself. Obviously not a good thing. Opiates and opioids have little of direct effect upon the heart other than they slow heart rate, which in most cases is a very positive situation. They also have a moderate uh, effect on lowering blood pressure. The changes are moderate and they have very few side effects. Induction drugs, uh, unfortunately, are much more problematic. The most popular induction drugs are thiopental and propofol. Both of these have profound effects on reducing cardiac contractility. In addition, propofol causes marked reduction in peripheral resistance, thus potentiating uh, hypotension and sometimes leading to reduced blood flow to vital organs, including the heart. This gra graph gives you a, an idea of how the vapors affect cardiac function. On the upper graph to the left, uh, you can see how mean arterial blood pressure is affected by the vapors and basically all of them cause a decrease in blood pressure, or at least mean arterial pressure. But there is a bit of a difference with desflurane, which tends to come down and then stabilize a bit, and with sevoflurane that also does that. Comes down, there's a drop in blood pressure, and then there's a stabilization. So you don't have to worry about it continuing to drop quite so much. On the right upper graph, you're looking at cardiac output affected by uh, vapors. And you can see the desflurane has a very slight effect on cardiac output. Initially a bit of a drop, and then it tends to come back and stabilize. Sevoflurane, a bit more profound, but the older drugs, isoflurane and particularly halothane, a continuing drop in cardiac output as the concentration of the vapor is increased. On the left lower graph, we're looking at systemic vascular resistance. So this is the resistance against which the heart works when it contracts. And you can see that isoflurane causes quite a profound drop in peripheral resistance, as does desflurane. This can be a good thing in the presence of poor cardiac output because it improves the ability of the heart to eject 
uh, blood uh, against a lower resistance. However, it may result in hypotension and decreased blood flow to organs. In the bottom slide to the right is heart rate, and you can see that desflurane initially causes very little change in heart rate, and then as you increase it, there's fairly marked increase in heart rate. Isoflurane, on the other hand, causes quite a nice stable increase in heart rate, and it stays uh, pretty much at a, at a level uh, that doesn't change for a period after that. Heart rate's critical in these patients because increases in heart rate increase oxygen demand by the heart. And so we don't like to see tachycardia, particularly in middle-aged people or older people. So how about the induction drugs? We already mentioned uh, propofol and pentothal. Uh, we're now going to talk about ketamine and uh, how it affects cardiac function. Ketamine is often used in patients who appear to be volume depleted at the time of surgery or have had trauma because it increases heart rate and increases blood pressure moderately. The problem is that it, uh, it can lead to increases in blood pressure that are unacceptable and it can lead to tachycardia or increased heart rate that's unacceptable. On the good side, it acts as a painkiller. So it's less opioid needs to be used. You can give ketamine without a whole lot of extra narcotic on board. The problem with ketamine, and one of the reasons why it isn't as widely used as it might otherwise be, is that people have what are called emergence phenomena when they start to wake up from ketamine, which can include hallucinations and quite strange behavior. Uh, patients will wake up and be picking at things in the air. They'll think they see bugs. Uh, they'll be very concerned about noises in the room. So at the time ketamine was used fairly regularly in the early 80s, the recovery rooms were often kept dark and very, very quiet, which meant you really couldn't see your patient and monitor them adequately. So that was totally unacceptable, and we no longer accept that as a property within our, our recovery rooms. Atomidate, which is a drug that uh, has been available in the United States for many years, but in many other countries hasn't been available because it wasn't marketed due to cost constraints, uh, is a very good drug to use in patients who have had brain trauma because it has very little effect on intracerebral blood pressure, uh, has very little effect upon the cardiovascular system, and oxygen, uh, cerebral oxygen delivery tends to remain stable. But it's not a perfect drug. Uh, it suppresses the release of cortisol from the adrenal cortex. And this may interfere with the body's ability to handle the stress of trauma, surgery, or anesthesia. And there are some reports that suggest that unexpected death following surgery, not at the time of surgery, but in the weeks to maybe a month following surgery, that unexpected death is higher in patients who have had automidate. So, what does the anesthesiologist do about these changes? Low blood pressure can reduce blood flow, thus oxygen supply to vital organs. Rapid heart rates can increase the work of the heart and increase the need uh, for myocardial oxygen, which is difficult to supply in the presence of low blood pressure. A blood pressure that is too high is also unacceptable, as it can lead to strokes and increased cardiac work, which may cause cardiac ischemia or heart attacks. So the anesthesiologist can modify these variables by careful administration of either stimulating drugs such as ep ephedrine or phenylephrine, uh, epinephrine or norepinephrine, which increase blood pressure and heart rate. Of course, all of these drugs uh, have their pros and cons, so careful understanding of each is necessary before one uses them. For instance, phenylephrine will increase uh, blood uh, pressure quite nicely, but only for a very short period of time and often causes quite a profound drop in heart rate, whereas the others all increase heart rate and tend to increase blood pressure. Constant monitoring of the patient's condition during and after anesthesia has shown to be the most important aspect of anesthesiology.